I'm sitting today. I've got a little bit of a bum knee, so I apologize for that. But we've been focusing on the last couple of Sabbaths on our core of gratitude since November is, after all, the month of Thanksgiving. So if you'll just allow me to do a very quick refresh. Uh, the first Sabbath, we talked about how our deep and pervasive sense of gratitude is rooted in the plan of salvation. And as a brief review of that discussion, we discussed how this amazing plan is not the usual, uh-oh, what do we do now, kind of contingency plan, which is so prevalent on this world, but rather a perfect plan conceived in the perfect mind of our Almighty Father, no doubt before he even had begun to create a single thing. And this perfect plan is deeply rooted in a great divine love that we can only dimly imagine. I mean, it's just incomprehensible, really. I further explained in that discussion that my sincere belief is that this rescue plan was also established in the great mind of the Father before he begot his Son. The Son of God was then lovingly and intentionally brought forth to be the one and only possible substitute for our sins. And as much as he was imbued with the fullness of the Father's divinity on, on one side, making him fully God, and then willingly accepted to take on humanity, which made him fully man. And only that exact combination would allow Jesus to be our substitute, to be our Savior. And then last Sabbath, we talked about the truth. And analogous to the previous discussion, there is one and only one truth just as there is one and only one Father, and just as there is one and only one begotten Son of God. God does not change, and neither does the truth. Psalms 25 says, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. We are so thankful for the truth. Amen? because it is our, our constant guide. And you know what? We vow never, and we talked about this earlier today, never to become complacent, never to feel that we have all the truth that we will ever need. Our prayer is always, always to be more and more like Jesus. And you know what? Jesus is truth. So if we're being more and more like him, guess what? We're being more and more in the truth that is just going to be. In a world where, as we all agree, truth is a shockingly scarce commodity, God wants his people, this group, to be intrepid truth seekers. Yes, I like that little phrase, by the way. That little tagline. But today we're going to talk about another scarce commodity. And I have a question for you. In this world, have we not become very, very accustomed to shortages? Right? I mean, energy shortages, oil, right? How about food shortages? What about water shortages? What about supply chain shortages? What about medicine shortages, and then labor shortages. Sometimes the list just gets longer every single day. This morning I want to talk about a, sh a shortage that you won't find on, on those lists, and yet it is actually a much more serious shortage than the others. And far from being a subtle issue, it is a glaringly obvious shortage. And I say that because you see, you see ample evidence of it everywhere you look. And I'm speaking of the hope shortage. 
if you are even remotely paying attention, you will read evidence of this shortage in books and news articles. You will hear its underlying voice in world update reports. You will see it everywhere. More than anything, you can see this lack of hope scribbled across the faces of people as you pass them on the highways and byways, on the streets and sidewalks. It's a look that cries out, what's the use? And it clearly enunciates, what are you going to do? But you see, unless you are a true believer and have grasped the amazing plan of salvation, unless you are a true believer and have anchored to that truth that never wavers, never changes, there really is no hope. In Romans 15, verse 13, we read, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the truth is, my friends, we serve a God of hope. This is not what the world would call blind hope, but it is based on our faith in the promises he has made. And these promises are not vague. Instead, they are wonderfully specific. As God who knows all sees all, he reveals information to us in order to bring hope to us. From the very beginning of this horrible conflict, and then throughout, God has consistently delivered messages of hope. For instance, <clears throat> following the fall of Adam and Eve, the words recorded in Genesis 3.15 conveyed hope. A hope that Adam and Eve clung to throughout their painfully long life. And so as we look at that message, let's realize the contextual background of, the, of when it was given. You see, our once perfect earthly parents had just committed what amounts to the mother of all sins, right? And that's literally true since that sin would engender a horrific progeny of all subsequent sins down through time and within the human race. But Adam and Eve 100% knew that they had broken God's commandments. They 100% knew what their ultimate penalty would end up being. But after all the questions, you know, where are you? What is this you have done? And after all the excuses, the woman did this, the serpent did that. After all of that, God spoke these incredible words of hope to the broken pair. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And isn't that true? I mean, isn't the serpent cursed above all, probably hated above all animals in the animal kingdom? He goes on to say, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And there it is, right there, in the middle of that well-deserved sanction, that richly deserved judgment, there was that hint of redemption, the wonderful kernel of hope. And so it has been throughout history. The angry, purging floodwaters shrink, the dark storm clouds recede to reveal what? To reveal the rainbow of promise and hope. As the earth repopulated after the flood and the spread of wickedness seemed to once again overwhelm the earth, God continued to protect and to bless his chosen remnant and to instill them with an unquenchable hope. And in this regard, there was, there's always been a stark difference between the, the worldly and the godly. For example, the Canaanite sun worshipers they were consumed with trying to appease their demanding and capricious deities. And in glaring contrast, absolutely everything about the sanctuary system continually pointed to the hope of a soon coming, all loving, anxious to forgive, 
ready to restore Savior. And then, after years of intense longing and watching and waiting and praying, hope came to earth as a tiny defenseless baby. Jesus of Nazareth was the culmination of all those prayers. He was the fulfillment of all those slaughtered lambs. It can legitimately be said that the Messiah's earthly ministry was a ministry of hope. Everywhere he went, crowds followed him. They they mobbed him. They cried out to him. And why did they do that? Well, they were just like us. They were broken. They were sick. They were disenfranchised. They were outcast. They were without hope. And Jesus gave them hope. He healed them. He loved them. He restored them. He he freed them. He gave them something to believe in and something to hope for. You know, the biblical records record and reveal so many examples of what I'm referring to. In the fifth chapter of John, we read, starting with the second verse, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now the Bible would seem to strongly imply that healings had actually occurred at this pool. But even if this was a belief based on legend, one thing is certain. This pool of Bethesda had become a pool of hope for many, many people, enough to constitute a a great multitude. So can you just imagine Jesus walking into that pool area and seeing that great multitude of sick people, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, all waiting, all desperately hoping how Jesus' heart must have been touched. But his gaze falls on one individual who personifies hopelessness like no other. The Bible says, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Thirty-eight years. That's a long, long time to be in this condition. Had he spent all thirty-eight years at the pool of Bethesda? We have no way of knowing. But perhaps he had been there long enough to to witness the miraculous stirring of the water. Maybe he had seen it happen more than once. And that would certainly add to the abject despair that we perceive in his response to Jesus' question. This unfortunate man was completely devoid of hope. He wasn't merely biding his time, waiting for some new medical procedure that promised to make him whole again. And clearly, after 38 years, it it wasn't a physical condition that would would just simply get better by, by itself or with the passage of more time. And it would also appear that he had been abandoned here with no accompanying friend, no, no family member to help him get into the water should it be moved. No hope. No hope. Until Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed and walked. You, can, you wonder if, if maybe he felt something just coursing through him, some electrical energy, but it says immediately, immediately he was healed. Jesus loved that man. Jesus deeply desired to heal him 
physically. But you know what else? Jesus deeply desired to heal him of his hopelessness. And in so doing, to send each one of us another one of those undeniable messages that he is hope. Psalms 147.11 says, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. And then at the end of his earthly ministry, while bloodied and dying on the cruel cross, Jesus, our Savior, the begotten Son of God, in spite of his unimaginable physical and mental anguish, shared a powerful message of hope with one who was being executed right next to him. The Gospel of Luke records this amazing exchange in the 23rd chapter. It reads, Then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same con condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. You know, we as believers, we talk about divine appointments, don't we? We mentioned it this morning. Well, this, this might just be the divine appointment of all divine appointments. Think about it. If this thief had been crucified on any other day except this particular day, he would have never had this two-minute conversation with Jesus. And you know what? He might have died as so many sadly die without acknowledging his Lord, without accepting his offer of salvation. Jesus represents a hope that, like him, is everlasting. It doesn't come with one of those expiration stickers best if used before this date. It is, however, an offer that requires our acceptance. And that acceptance must be made during our lifetime. And so 2,000 years ago, on that hill called Calvary, one condemned man accepted this offer only moments before it was to be forever withdrawn. Mere moments before that hope would be eternally extinguished. Now, I don't know about all of you, but for me, there are many, many individuals that I simply can't wait to meet in heaven. And this man is one of them. But where do we derive hope from today? Do we, do we trust in humanity to get this whole thing figured out? Do we believe that politicians will actually do what they say they are going to do instead of continuing to power grab and pander for votes and make sure that the system is sufficiently biased in their favor and entertain and accept bribes by powerful lobbyists and tirelessly hunt after photo opportunities? Do we trust in the great minds of science to come up with that perfect cure-all medicine which will essentially eliminate cancer and heart disease and to develop the modern-day equivalent of manna, an, e an easy-to-produce, inexpensive, universally available, nutritionally complete food source that will solve all the world's hunger and radically reduce disease? Do we trust the world leaders to live in peace and to quit trying to blow each other up? Do we trust criminals to stop stealing, stop cheating, stop kidnapping, stop killing? Do we trust those greedy drug cartels to wake up tomorrow and just stop being greedy? 
Do we trust drug users to wake up tomorrow and just stop using? And do we somehow imagine that Satan will decide to call this whole good good versus evil conflict off? Just concede defeat, withdraw his opposition, decommission his troops, and surrender to his well-deserved punishment. I don't know if you still remember, but I started this discussion by stating that the world is dealing with a hope shortage. And in light of this, in light of this list that I just read of hypothetical questions, do you better understand why that would be true? In Psalms 20, verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Try to imagine for a moment what our hope quotient would be if we didn't have God, if we didn't have his promises, if we didn't have his perfect rescue plan, if we didn't have Jesus, his dearly beloved, brought forth son, who is willing to become our savior. Oh, but see, you and I, we know that we have Jesus. We know that if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans 8, 25. So you know what? With that hope, we act differently, don't we? Don't we? We live differently, don't we? We look differently because we have that hope. And it literally oozes out of every pore of our being. You see, we don't have that look of despair like the world has. Our eyes aren't focused on what the politicians promise. Now, we don't naively assume that the world leaders have our best interest at heart. We read the prophecies and we know that this world is going to get worse instead of better. We accept that. We accept that because we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. As believers, our perspective is markedly different. Without this divine perspective, one can only see a world that is declining in absolutely every category and dying in absolutely every conceivable way. You see, our perspective includes hope for the future. While this world, this world has its collective heart set on earthly issues like equal rights and climate control and peace. Not us. Our hearts are elsewhere. Colossians 3 counsels us, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You know, there are some elite individuals in this world. Let's call them the the puppet masters because it is they who pull the strings. These people are working to establish a new world order. And as is true with virtually everything else on this planet, greed for control and power are the primary motivators. If they were allowed to bring these plans to fruition, Would the world be a better place? I don't think I need to tell you the answer to that question. The good news is that these plans will never be allowed to fully develop because Jesus, the divine Son of God, has told us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there 
you may be also. Oh, you better believe there will be a new order. There will be a new world altogether. Listen to these words from Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. What a hope we have. It should stir up an intense feeling of gratitude to our loving God. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isn't that a blessed hope? 